before we begin, all of us at the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health res respectfully acknowledge that our advocacy, education, and learning across the country takes place on the occupied and unceded lands of many Native American tribes. To acknowledge this land is to recognize its long history and our place in that history. It's to recognize that these lands and waters and their significance for the people who lived here and continue to live here in this country and whose practices and spirit, spiritualities were, are, and shall always be tied to the land and water. Today's webinar is the eighth in our 2022 uh, Climate Justice uh, webinar series as part of the Climate Health and Equity Fellowship Program. The CHEF uh, Fellowship, as we uh, call it, is a program that recognizes the need for more diversity in climate and health leadership and a sharper focus on equitable uh, climate solutions. The goal of the fellowship is to empower doctors of color from populations that face far greater burdens from climate effects, excuse me, uh, and are underrepresented in medicine uh, to become leaders in the climate and health and equity uh, education, advocacy, and policy solutions. My name is Dr. Mark Mitchell, and I'm the program director uh, for the CHEF Fellowship. Also joining me from the consortium to run this webinar is our program assistant, uh, Clarissa Payton, and Jordan uh, Curry Carter, our program manager. Clarissa will be available throughout the, uh, through the chat to answer any technical questions during the webinar. Our other team members uh, on the webinar are Dr. Bernice Curry, the Western Associate Director of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship Pro Program. Um, she will be presenting later today. And in addition, we have our program manager, uh, Dr. Kimberly Williams. This webinar series is hosted by the Medical Society Consortium on, on Climate and Health and is held for one hour on the second Friday of each month uh, from, uh, from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, today, we are honored uh, to have Dr. Uh, Tanya uh, Kimmick uh, Tawau, uh, Assistant Professor in the, Clark, in the Department of Midwifery and the Director of the Master of Arts Program in Maternal and Child Health uh, Systems uh, at Bester University. And we're also are pleased to have Dr. Uh, Venice Curry. Uh, the Western As Associate Director of the Climate and Health Equity Fellowship Program. Rather than using our time to provide further description of their impressive work, um, we're placing a link to their bios in the chat. Um, as a healthcare provider, it's important that you consider the role that healthcare systems and providers play in regard to climate and health. In this webinar, Dr. Uh, Tanya Kemet uh, Tawau will provide background about psychosocial stress and its association with racism, adverse childhood experiences, cumulative exposure, and, the, uh, and psychological vulnerability. Uh, Dr. Curry will follow her and will discuss uh, community psychiatry and provide a cultural psychiatric uh, focus on in inequities existing in various communities. Uh, Dr. Curry will also briefly uh, review the equity and, and mental health toolkit. The general format for today's webinar will be two 20-minute presentations um, by our speakers, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers from our audience. We ask that you put your comments, links to any resources that you, that you may recommend, or any questions that you have for the presenters in the chat box at any time during this presentation. We'll get to as many of the questions uh, as we can during the uh, Q&A period. Please keep yourself muted so we're not interrupted by um, background noises and keep your cameras off. Uh, Dr. Tawal, you may begin. 
Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Mark. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. And um, I'll just say that, um, you know, Mark uh, first to ask me to talk about topics that I am um, very passionate about. So yay. Um, and then he asked me to uh, condense it down to 20 minutes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> um, so I'm going to I'm going to quickly discuss the science of ACEs, and um, then um, and toxic stress. I'll talk briefly about what we're doing here in California, and um, and then uh, move into some of the theorized mechanisms about how environmental exposures and stress impact to produce poor perinatal outcomes. Then I'll conclude to with. Um, trying to understand how the racial disparities in preterm birth persist and provide a framework for us to think about cumulative impacts. Um, so I'll dive right in. Um, the first ACEs study was done by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser in 1998. And since then, we've got more than two decades of research um, documenting the association of ACEs with health and well being across the lifespan. And you already know, you probably already know that ACEs are associated with higher risk of poor health, but they are also associated with the negative effects on educational achievement and employment potential. In addition, the, the historical and ongoing effects of racism, poverty, living in under resourced or racially segregated neighborhoods and experiencing housing or food insecurity, AKA the social determinants of health, can tr contribute to and exacerbate the effects of ACEs. Um, so diving into the science, a report released by the CDC um, in 2019, using data from uh, the um, a hundred, uh, about 150,000 adults over 18 participating in the behavior risk factor surveillance system found that about 60, 61% of ad adults had experienced at least one type of ACE in their lifetime and um, over 15% reported four or more ACEs. And they, when comparing the exposed to unexposed, the people with four or more ACEs, you know, and of course, statistically adjusting for confounding factors like race, uh, sex, age, they found, you know, these um, really incredible uh, odds ratios um, at, for increased health risks. In California, the California Department of Healthcare Services, um, in partnership with the Office of the California Surgeon General, launched this ACEs Aware project that requires provider training uh, and screening. And this year, they announced really that uh, after um, two key milestones, um, about after three years, 12,000 California clinicians have been trained. and um, more than um, 800,000 um, adults, uh, wait, sorry, 12,000 clinicians, California clinicians have been trained and they have um, screened over 800,000 uh, Medicaid uh, adults and children and found pretty similar results to the, the CDC that 60% of um, Californians report at least one ACE. And, um, and what we're seeing too is that the pandemic has exacerbated uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of these ACEs. Um, so I just wanna talk a minute about toxic stress. And um, so right now I'm feeling a little stressed and so I've got some adrenaline rushing through my system, some cortisol, but, but what that's going to, this momentary stress, right, is actually going to make me do a better presentation for you. Um, my awareness is heightened um, and I'm uh, more functional actually, right, and to do a better job. But we're really talking about chronic stress, that really unrelenting, um, crushing 
stress that that folks experience every day, like worrying about whether or not your daycare provider is going to show up because it's a family member who's a little bit unreliable so that you can get to work on time uh, because your boss has already threatened to fire you if you're late once again, right? And so a large and um, growing body of research has documented that um, toxic stress it, it, it has documented the underlying mechanism by which ACEs are associated with, with toxic stress through the chronic act activation of the stress, stress response system. Um, toxic stress results in dysregulation of the limbic hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, elevating levels of catecholines, cortisol, and inflammatory cytokines. So uh, let's so let's look now at this. I, I really appreciated this when I saw this paper had come out by Padula et al from the Echo. Um, project, which I hope you're familiar with. And if you're not, check it out. It's a really exciting um, national collaborative um, effort to really understand the underlying mechanisms of children's health. Um, but uh, so so looking specifically at this at this framework and um, it, that proposes the biological mechanisms, you know, pot possibly potentiated by the combined exposures to the psychosocial and environmental stresses that um, contribute to perinatal outcomes. So just want you to notice that the, um, the, the legend at the top there, um, at the, the color, the color coding, which helps, you know, helps to, so the exposures are in blue, the entry ports are in yellow, um, and we see the biological mediators in red. Um, so environmental exposures can enter the maternal circulation through multiple, multiple, you know, the reproductive um, reproductive tract or or, or breathing, and um, and then come into direct contact with the placenta and cause um, either direct tissue damage or um, the subtler or equally harmful inflammatory processes. Additionally, the microbiome of the placenta can be affected through this or the chemical itself can cause uh, epigenetic changes. It has already been documented that placental, uh, Placental inflammation and disturbances in the maternal microbiome are associated with low birth weight and preterm birth. Additionally, placental measures have been documented, documented to actually moderate um, the harmful effects of many maternal um, health conditions. Uh, and so in addition to directly harming the placenta, prenatal environmental chemical exposures can negatively impact uh, maternal health, including possible effects on the kidney, liver, liver cardiovascular system, uh, metabolic and immune functions that can lead to exacerbate uh, gestational, gestational diseases um, or hypertension I'm sorry, gene um, gestational diabetes or hypertension, which in turn may lead to adverse perinatal outcomes. So endocrine disrupting chemicals now um, may affect the, the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, the hypothalamic pituitary um, gonada, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid and glycopsychosocial accesses. So multiple ways that uh, the endocrine disruptions can impact um, that, uh, that can then translate into downstream immunoendocrine disturbances and inflammatory activation. These mechanisms of chemical damage to mother, um, 
to mother and babe um, may be shared with and potentiated by the psychosocial stressors. Um, we have evidence of the link between um, the psychosocial stress and inflammation through, through the hip, pretty solid uh, evidence of that. So, so children's health, however, um, children, I'm sorry. So, so you'll see that our understanding of the combined effects of the environmental chemicals and psychosocial stressors are emerging as potentially important yet really understudied factors that affect um, our future. However, environmental chemicals, other than air pollution, um, ha have re are really understudied, as well as the psychological stresses, such as discrimination um, and the impact of racism. And so this is where I want to actually talk about the um, Braverman paper and Sadly, my, my second screen isn't working. I thought I would be able to just slide it in here. But I have to take a moment and unshare my screen, then share my screen again. And so, um, you know, I, it, I, I, again, this is another paper that, uh, you know, landed in my inbox or I don't know if someone sent it to me or, or how I found it, but then I was just like, oh my God, this is an amazing piece of work and really beautifully provides, um, uh, this is what I wanted to end with, a framework for us to really think about um, how we look at health and, and how we look at the both the cumulative exposures of stressors and, and, and the cumulative impact of environmental chemicals. I really appreciate that they, they um, looked at the literature, uh, the body of literature addressing disparities, the black white disparities in preterm birth um, from this framework of thinking about upstream, midstream, downstream causes, and then actually the biological mechanisms of preterm birth. Now, I know many of you, um, I know I was, when I was in midwifery school, um, every, uh, you know, we looked at all of the, uh, we were taught the risk factors for preterm birth, right? And, um, and what this paper has shown is that many of the risk factors that we have thought of in the past as potentially contributing to the, dis the black white disparity actually don't hold up when you critically review the literature. And so what I've done is I've, I've highlighted the 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 ones that um that they identified from this review that that really there's sufficient literature to um there's sufficient literature to support that they are contributors to the black white disparity in preterm birth and so we see here not the things that we were taught in 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 our in our programs um that were in the textbooks that need to be changed now um but neighborhood environmental exposures, solid evidence about that, you know, stress, neighborhood ec socioeconomic disadvantage, and, um, and racism in multiple forms and through multiple pathways and biological mechanisms. Okay, so sorry about the uh, clunkiness here. Uh, and um, so, so preterm birth has um, already consistently, uh, it, sorry, socio. So a lot of times, the 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 cause that's given, or the cause that's thought about about preterm birth, is socioeconomic d disadvantage or ac uh, limited access to care. Um, but we see that that socioeconomic disadvantage when we're looking at environmental exposures is not the only cause of disproportionate exposures to hazardous neighborhood conditions. Um, uh, uh, Woodruff et al. found that race was actually a stronger predictor of residents in polluted areas than educational attainment, which of course educational attainment is strongly correlated with income. 
but environmental injustice. So the disproportionate location of toxic substance substances in black and brown communities is a highly um, plausible uh, mechanism for explaining disparities that we see in reproductive health conditions and as well as other health effects. Um, I also, you know, appreciate this paper that um, from 2020 that uh, was generated by the Black Mamas Matter Alliance research uh, team and that gave us a foundation for really looking at the web of causation. Um, and so really building on the work of the w, uh, the World Health Organization when they when they identified you know, the, the term and, and, and coined the term, the social determinants of health. And so it, it, I encourage you to have a look at this paper as well. Um, I, I, I love this image that they have in this paper that really shows that, that um, you know, increased maternal and infant mortality and morbidity sits in this web of causation. So what, what do we need to do? Well, you know, we, uh, well, we, we all need to vote. <laughs> so, and we need to make sure that we take everybody that we can to vote with us. Okay, but what can we do as clinicians? Um, well, we need, to, we need to get out of our head old, um, old ideas and thoughts about why people are sick, right? And then we need to provide trauma-informed care and really do our work to understand how trauma can affect the health of the person that's um, sitting in front of us, or if we're doing work with communities and make sure that, that we are screening for ACEs. So we're doing the appropriate screening and I'm sure the the um, the next speaker is going to talk. Speaker is going to talk about screening for mental health concerns, and then following up with culturally appropriate um, assessments and interventions that really are addressing um, the related mental health and um, and uh, somatic issues, and um, working in community with our colleagues who are in social work who are in behavioral health uh, to make sure that we have ways that we can make uh, linkages for uh, care when we identify um, that, that it's needed. So one last word, um, I, I am an epidemiologist and a midwife and I value the scientific method and I'm a data nerd and um, an evidence-based practice um, but also, um, I appreciate um, and really do want to uplift our, the ways um, of our, my communities. Um, some of you may have experienced the, the healing of gospel music that filled you with joy and euphoria when times were hard in your life. Um, in similar ways, the Orisha dances of the Yoruba people, both in Nigeria and in Cuba, the, the dances of Haitian voodoo or um, Bayan condomble or the all night Nyabingi drumming of um, the Rastafarians all provided opportunities for healing and wisdom expression in their respective communities. Um, and this is African peoples in the diaspora have for generations um, had these methods of, of, of community healing. And, and this is in direct uh, opposition to the, the theoretical book models that dominate um, Western traditions, right? And much of today's clinical training, uh, educational systems really belittle traditional wisdom and refuse to treat such forms of knowledge um, seriously, um, since colonialization and the expansion of European imperialism, disembodied knowledge has really dominated the Americans as, um, as the valued social paradigm. And so we have been encouraged to think about the scientific method as primary, um, and, um, 
rather than equal to practical um, experiential or kinesthetic knowledge. So things are changing and we're learning um, to combine the science with traditional forms of knowledge. And we need to also pay attention to our own healing and um, addressing our own wounded child as we work with um, people and communities. Thank you. And thanks so much, uh, Tanya. Um, I really appreciate that. You know, a lot of people uh, that I run into don't understand that there's real science behind uh, toxic stress uh, and the link between uh, the science and the uh, culture and that there is a such thing as cultural healing. So appreciate your um, bringing that uh, to the forefront. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Venice Curry. Um, so, um, why don't we just go ahead and, and begin, Dr. Curry? Invitation. Uh, I really want to just thank our previous speaker. That was uh, really excellent, and um, I'd love to talk with you later about some. Uh, I want to start by saying that. Um, Three things we can start with. Climate change is real. Racism is real. And the mental health impacts when these two collide is very much real. So I'm Dr. Terrence Curry. I am the Western Associate Director for Climate Health and Equity. And um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, community psychiatry, a little about uh, race and culture. And then I will end up with it going over the toolkit just for the, so that we can have some idea about opportunities for healing. So next slide. So I want to start with where we are in terms of understanding how prevalent mental health and mental illness is. And so this is 2020 data. And basically um, any mental illness is, is coded here. And so the prevalence is 21%. So overall 21% of our population uh, suffers from any mental illness. Uh, you can see that it's slightly higher for females, but look at the age and you'll see 18 to 25 is, is a bit more high with prevalency. And then if you look at race and ethnicity, you'll see that those who identify as two or more races actually have the highest prevalence of any mental illness. And so I think you can think of depression, anxiety, uh, the gamut of, of uh, thought disorders, mood disorders. We are hearing now about eco-anxiety. And so um, that's a new term that's, that's becoming more popular. But again, what we're not expecting is that there will be new psychiatric diagnoses. We think that the current stressors and the current context of our, of our, uh, our living and breathing will simply be an exacerbation of existing uh, mental health. So we are not looking, uh, nor do we believe that there will be new mental illnesses, just that they will be exacerbated uh, by the situations and the context that we find ourselves in. Eco-anxiety has emerged as a variant of anxiety, but again, um, there are lots of pathways for that and we'll talk briefly about those. Next slide. So I wanna start by just, calling your attention to um, one of the solutions that we have to think about America's mental health crisis. And it basically already exists. Um, this is a slide from the New York Times really identifying that back in 1963, there was a Community Mental Health Center Construction Act. This was the last bill that John F. Case signed. His idea was to create 1500 community health centers across the nation. And those centers would be located in catchment areas they would offer basically five um, different services. So community education, inpatient and outpatient facilities, emergency response, partial um, hospitalization. They would serve as a single point of contact for patients so that they didn't have to search around for uh, finding help and finding assistance when they needed it the most, but that it would be available to them in their own community. And that would help to keep them not only connected socially uh, to the place that they lived, but also relational, 
relationally with the parents or the family that they had already um, been in contact with. And so this idea of these community health centers was going to be built based on shutting down the old uh, state asylums and psychiatric hospitals, and then the state recovering and recouping that money, reinvesting it in, these, in the construction of these centers and finding consistent revenue to support them. Um, if you know anything about history or if you recall this period of time, uh, the population of psychiatric hospitals and asylums dropped by about 95%. Um, but what didn't happen was that there was an investment in building these community centers. And so, yes, people were released from the hospital, but they were released without social services, without a social net. And what we see today is uh, many of them receiving services as criminal justice inmates um, and not so much as um, pa patients who need um, mental health services. Next slide, please. So community psychiatry as defined by Hume is really the maximum utilization of community resources. And really the focus is to tr for treatment and for rehabilitation. Uh, it's simultaneously treatment oriented, prevention oriented and community oriented. And really to reduce the, by a minimum, all of the discoverable means, the mental disorders of a given population. And so community psychiatry really moved from an institution and moved to a community, trying to maintain the existing relationships, trying to strengthen um, the capacity of individuals by continuing to keep uh, their connections with family and with familiar items and familiar places. Um, I've been doing what I cons consider more preventive psychiatry and um, Part of that has really taken me out of the space of practicing psychiatry in, in one room and with one patient to really look more broadly at the community itself and how it is constructed and how neighborhoods are built. And so community psychiatry, preventive psychiatry for me has really included looking at city plans, general plans, uh, neighborhood use and zoning, um, all of those city and elected official um, uh, duties that ordinarily, uh, as a physician, we would not be engaged in, we would not be familiar with. Uh, it has been a learning curve and uh, not a very pretty one, um, but there have been some victories along the way. I share that because part of the struggle in providing adequate and appropriate and quality care is to recognize the um, role that environment plays but two steps beyond that or before that is really the role that the political um, determinants of health actually play in determining how our neighborhoods are constructed, whether or not they are heat islands because of lack of trees and lack of investment, whether or not, as our speaker uh, just said, whether or not all of the toxic facilities are located in one community in one area, thereby overburdening uh, families for generations and creating poor outcomes for um, families, children, preterm birth, all of those uh, connected to uh, stationary sources of pollution that are traditionally located in low income and communities of color. Next slide. So I wanna just remind us of what race is and what it is not. <laughs> It's really a social and a political construction. There's no inherent genetic or biological basis. It's a tool and it's used by social institutions to arbitrarily categorize and divide groups of, of individuals. Uh, what we consider um, race when we consider pathology and psychiatry, we very much know that the, the lens and the framework is very much shaped by the experiences that we have uh, the framework and the background that we bring to the table, our, our understanding of ourselves and our ability to sit with another person and recognize uh, their differences as well as their common ground. Next slide. So when we talk about racism and we talk about it in terms of poor health outcomes and the construction of neighborhoods, it's race prejudice plus social and institutional power. It's a system of advantages based on race, but also a system of oppression based on race. 
And so it is grounded in white supremacy as a system. And so when we think about why we have preterm birth, why we have the African-American infant mortality rate as high as it is, um, as we want to make sure that we're understanding that it is grounded in a system and that system is simply doing what it is um, designed to do, which is to perpetuate its own ideology. Next slide. So when we think about climate and the ways that it will impact um, our physical, our mental, and our community health, uh, this slide really just shows you some of the experiences that we've all just recently observed, uh, whether or not you're in Arizona where there's a drought or California, uh, whether or not you've experienced heavy rains, excessive temperatures, um, sea rising levels, fires, or just other weather events, we all know that these will negatively impact our medical and our physical health. And so besides the landscape changing and us changing our ability to be fit, to be outside, to be um, safely uh, active, we also know that there are increased exposures to many things. The so waterborne and vector-borne illnesses, yes. Uh, parasites, yes. Um, viruses that we are not familiar with, yes. Um, but all of these contribute to mental health stress. And so that stress, that anxiety, that over uh, stimulation of our cortisol loop where we are constantly on high alert, uh, think about that in terms of, um, of being in a racist society, being on, um, being on high alert all the time, and how that over time, it, it, you know, weathers you, weathers your system, uh, changes your immune response and makes you um, much more vulnerable to everyday challenges, but also major disruptions. And so sometimes we will see that lead to community health issues as we've talked about with inter increased interpersonal aggression, violence and crime, social instability. Part of this is an, a, a culture of scarcity where if, if you are, um, undergoing or a part of a, of a disaster where there's a sense of scarcity about the resources, about materials, about uh, opportunities. Uh, you can see that your, your sense of survival has to heighten and be kicked up a notch. And that puts you in a place where aggression is more likely, where uh, poor decision-making happens and where there's a, de a decrease in community cohesion. And so we are, sort of seeing everything sort of fraying apart. We're seeing normal, um, normal attitudes and normal um, uh, behaviors sort of go by the wayside and we see sort of a free for all where people, I would say just letting their id sort of run the program uh, instead of having, instead of having it uh, normally checked, uh, it's just sort of run amok. So you can see that those populations that are the most vulnerable are gonna be the elderly, those that are infirmed, children, and certainly uh, pregnant women. Next slide, please. So this is a developmental perspective that really tries to, to think about what happens across the life cycle when you talk about climate change and mental health. And so the mental health vulnerability basically increases at uh, a nonlinear level. But there are some opportunities to intervene if people are exposed uh, to challenges or um, uh, disasters. So you'll see in the green where there's a mother and infant at you're at the lower end of the spectrum earlier on in life. Uh, the ability to intervene is, is much more effective because you have more plasticity. And if the intervention is appropriate and uh, sufficient, then you have a low risk trajectory for mental health vulnerabilities. But as you go through the life cycle, what you'll notice is that childhood and adolescence, the high risk trajectory starts to increase, partly because you're coming into contact with new environmental stressors, new stressors in general. And you may not have an adequate response to the previous ones that you were exposed to as a child. So as your, as your plasticity or your ability to be flexible and adapt starts to decrease, you're also hit with new stressors. And so this can be overwhelming. And as you get towards the end, towards the adulthood, you can see that 
the adaptations uh, are less effective, that, it, that the later that they occur, the less effective they are. And you have then developed a, a kind of vulnerability that is much harder to manage. And so over the course of life, this is, um, this is the idea that um, the exposures can be integrated, they can be additive, they can be cumulative, um, but the idea of over the course of life that there are ways to intervene uh, is what gives us uh, some hope and some places for uh, really doing research um, and figuring out how we can better provide um, services, but also be better prepared. Next slide. So I want to just, before I talk about our community kit, I want to just share a little bit about um, some of those experiences of racism and how they do impact, um, how they are impacted by show up in the life cycle. And so uh, one of the uh, experiences that I recently had uh, was uh, fighting with our city council about uh, the placement of um, light industrial zoning in an area that is already overburdened. Overburdened because it has been an area that was redlined initially. And we know that redlining was one of those tools that was very helpful in segregating communities and making sure that investments um, were not equally distributed. And in that unequal distribution, we find that those inequities uh, in terms of health outcomes very much mirror um, the layout of the land. And so if you were to look in um, communities across the nation, you'd see those communities that were redlined show the exact same kinds of statistics around birth outcomes, preterm birth, infant mortality, chronic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and certainly asthma. And so in our, in our fight to um, push back on our local governments, um, we have found that part of the challenge has been that <laughs> there is a significant amount of, of unwillingness to do anything different. And that manifests itself in rezoning, zoning land that can be used to continue to add industrial sites to communities overburdened, even those that are supported by the state uh, in terms of trying to clean it up. And so the continued sort of placing of, of toxic industries in our communities is one part of the challenge of, and one part of the, of the outcome that we see uh, with racism, how it is systemic, how it colors the way that our communities are built, how they are sustained and maintained. It also challenges the educational systems that we have where tax dollars uh, support schools and the better, the, the larger your tax bracket, the larger your tax um, con contribution, the better your schools uh, will be funded. And so that continues to, sh to show itself in economic disparities. And so when you have the combination of economic disparities, um, educational uh, opportunities that are lost, you're living in a place where you're much more likely to have climate disasters because of locations, whether or not you have trees or uh, heat islands that are going to in intensify excessive heat, uh, whether or not you have options for transportation and for actually accessing the internet. All of these are really determined by local decisions, local city council and elected officials who then can continue to construct um, neighborhoods that will challenge our health and well-being. So part of the challenge and part of what uh, prompted the Community Health Network to put together this community healing kit is the fact that there is cultural trauma that happens. And I share this, this photo of Fannie Lou Hamer who fought for, for voting rights, um, partly because she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I think we probably all have been there um, a time or two, um, but she is a person for the right and partly because she saw voting as part of the solution. Next slide, please. 
So one of the things that, that this community healing kit suggests is that we address the root causes of anti-Black racism, that we deal with historical and continuing racial trauma, and that that begins with knowing that our feelings are real and warranted, that our feelings have emerged out of 400 years of systemic racial oppression. But as a community, we uh, elders and young people can work together, but we will be the ones who free ourselves. We have to acknowledge that systemic racial trauma exists and that it does uh, provide, it does stir up feelings of anger and frustration and hopelessness at times. And that if we understand it, we have a better opportunity um, to figure out how to address it and also to intervene and protect ourselves and our next generations. Next slide, please. So the socio-ecological socio model of health basically just reminds us that we are individuals connected to our interpersonal circles of family, friends, and social networks, that there's an organizational piece and that our community has cultural values and norms and a built environment that can support or nurture us. And ultimately public policy is sort of what um, is overriding as an umbrella. And so at these particular places, we have an opportunity to intervene. And that is part of the, the healing process is that we would be looking at these spaces, recognizing what we can do in these particular um, arenas. Next slide. So end of starting with the individual, we wanna go through self-care strategies. Um, we'll provide this for our fellows, but basically just understanding the signs and stress of, signs of stress and trauma, um, staying grounded and making sure that you are um, capable of being a, a resource to those in your next fear. Next slide. Um, keeping us together, so keeping yourself together, the next level would be keeping us together as a family. That would include family care, community care, making sure that you're reaching out to people, that you have some sanctuaries, some safe places, and that you actually recall, you remember to draw on the wisdom of elders and ancestors and previous experiences to remind you uh, of your capacity and your resilience. And certainly we are a resilient people. And then finally, taking care of your children and youth, offering reassurance, monitoring them for overexposure to news because that can be overwhelming and monitoring for anger for our youth because that can often mask the sadness that they are not comfortable sharing with us. Um, the other thing that you can do is to provide healing circles and um, making sure that there are, sa again, safe spaces for sharing information and sharing feelings. Um, next slide, I think we're about to open. So yeah, so thank you, Dr. Curry. We certainly um, appreciate your um, presentation. Um, wanted to try to squeeze in um, a uh, a question or or two. Uh, if uh, again, if you have questions, you can uh, put them in the chat. If we don't have time to, um, we'll, but we'll only have time to uh, cover one or two. Uh, so just wanted um, to remind people uh, to, um, well, why don't we just go to, directly to questions. So Jordan, um, do we have any questions for uh, Dr. Tawal or Dr. Curry? We do. Um, and I'll start with Dr. Tawal. Um, the first question we had was really with regards to uh, Resma's my grandmother's hands and how we can get this somatic information about racially focused care further practiced in clinical circles. Can can you say the last sentence of the question, Jordan? I yeah, I got the sure. part about my grandmother's hands. Sure. Just how can we get um, somatic information about racially focused care further practiced in clinical circles? You know, I, I, I really think that um, the uh, Resma's book, My Grandmother's Hands, is a, a really um, beautiful place to start. Um, our National Professional Association actually 
over several months, uh, read that book and and worked on it um, together um, as a as a um, our leader, the board of directors, as a leadership team, to um, you know really begin to understand um, you know that those 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 deeply embedded. Um, um, underlying, you know, foundational causes of ill health and, um, and also really beginning to think about your own biases and where your own biases come from. So I think that um, My Grandmother's Hands is an excellent book to do, to, to work through on your own. It's not one you sit down and read, you actually do the exercises. Um, and, um, you know, I think that doing work for for um for the clinicians um for white clinicians i think it's important that um they uh looking at books like um uh oh i can't remember the name um how to become an anti racist uh i can't remember the name of the author if any if anybody wants to drop that in the chat um that would be good it his name is leaving me now um at understanding white fragility. Um, I think, you know, Isabel Wilkins. So there's a lot, of, there's so many good books out there right now that, yes, thank you, um, uh, Kendi. Um, and I think that it's important that we engage in this work um, in, in community, in community of professionals. Um, and then that, and additionally, the work needs to be done together and then I think that uh, we need to also develop affiliation circles so that people of color can gather in their own circles and deal with their um, their colorism and um, and some of their some of the biases that we have in, in, inherited, and 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 white communities and white clinicians need to work together around their understanding of white white privilege. I hope that right. answers that person's question. Yeah. Mark, you want to jump in and help me here? Yes, uh, I just wanted to let people know that um, the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, we have uh, a tab about um, uh, anti-racism and, um, uh, and equity. And so we have a lot of resources listed um, on that page. Um, why don't we take one more question. I know we started a bit late, but um, uh, and so we'll go maybe a minute or two over. Uh, but um, oh, uh, so Jordan, is there another? Yes. Question? So Dr. Curry, this next question is for you um, from Yvonne, uh, stating many don't see the connection of racism and substandard care. Um, and so really wanting you to, to lean in about how do we best continue to educate to change the outcomes? Yeah, I think you can look at your own local statistics. And I, one way that I've been able to, one way I've been able to really drive that point home is to look at something like the infant mortality rate or preterm birth because counties keep those, uh, those statistics. And then to look at what your um, what the existing issues are in those neighborhoods, because it will be um, you will be able to to see where those pockets are. And so by talking about by selecting one issue and really driving uh, drilling down on specifics, you can start to talk about what's happening in that community and look at the inequities. Talk about those for infant mortality in, in somewhere like West Fresno, we have some very definite pockets that line up with the red lining, but also line up with um, Cal Enviro Screen 4.0, which tells us here are the areas where you're most likely to have heavy population pop pollution. And so pollution burden uh, greater than 97% um, of the, uh, the population across the state. You can look at it by census tract. And so really helping to give information um, about what's happening. And for elected officials uh, looking at their constituents, um, the issues in their particular areas, providing them with some basic information and education, and then being consistent uh, with just um, 
staying on them and talking about it consistently. Um, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Curry. I know we can go on much longer, but we need to wrap up this session. So I'd like to thank our speakers and thank all of you for participating in this webinar series. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Um, as a reminder, these webinars are held on the second Friday of the month. The next webinar is scheduled for November 11th and the topic is engaging environmental justice and climate justice communities. Uh, before you leave, we ask that you take a moment to complete the webinar survey uh, that will be in the chat box um, now. Um, so we'd like to uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, support for this webinar series was made possible from, with funding from Johnson & Johnson, the Energy Foundation, the American Medical Association, and the American College of Physicians. Uh, thank you to our sponsors and thank you to our audience for listening. This now concludes our session, um, so have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>